inside the parliament, their objective had been achieved. Women, children and those considered to be non-combatants were separated and a few allowed to leave. Among those who managed to sneak out of the house is current NAR leader Anthony Smart. The Jamaat by then had identified three specific targets. I remember the first thing they, they, they were asking, um, where is, um, you know, where is Robinson? Where is Selby? And I remember them saying directly, the IMF man. Where is Selby, the IMF man? And um, where is um, Richardson? Soon they had their targets separated. And he says, I want you to, um, to tell the, 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 the people out there, tell the police and the army that the, the Jamaat has taken over the country and um, has taken over the country and that they must um, remove themselves from the, the area. But Mr. Robinson would have none of it and instead issued his now famous order. I was incensed by the manner in which we were treated during that first night. Uh, how we were humiliated, how we were roughed up, how we were made to lie face downwards on the floor, our pants down, Mr. Richardson and I and others. Uh, we are legs tied together to a tourniquet, arms to high up, to our backs to a tourniquet, face downwards, unable even to turn unless we had extremely excruciating pain and the kind of man and attitude and then they called upon us to talk to those outside in order to prevent them from attacking the building. I thought that I would show total defiance in such circumstances. I shouted murderers, torturers, and I called upon the forces outside to attack with full force. And that was when they got shot. Exactly when. Back at TTT, Abu Bakr and his team were unaware of the drama taking place inside the parliament chamber. The hostages had been contained and the woman and a few other people sent home. At 6 p.m. this afternoon, the government of Trinidad and Tobago was overthrown. The prime minister and members of the cabinet are under arrest. We are asking everybody to remain calm. The revolutionary forces are commanded to control the streets. There shall be no looting or interference with persons or property. We are having negotiations with the army who is assisting in keeping the peace. The police are commanded not to raise arms against the people. This animosity and hatred and this nation must now come to an end. But the fact is that while Baka had several government MPs under arrest, a number remained outside. And I said, but you have to be crazy. If there is one person outside, and I am here, the government couldn't be overthrown. What, what is he proceeded to the St. Clair police station and then to Camp Ogden. At Ogden, the security forces and government forces were starting to mobilize. But according to Myers, not everyone was willing to respond to the call. I remember with much displeasure attempting to reach an individual critical to that whole process. And it was only after a fit of rage and agony uh, shouting out this person's name, saying that we knew that he was outside, but we cannot locate him. When someone, a soldier, right next to me, said, but I know where this man is. Efforts were made to contact other key figures, opposition leader Basdeo Pande and PNM leader Patrick Manning. Well, you know, Mr. Pande is famous response or wake me up when it's over and subsequently that is an NAR business. Uh, the present leader of the opposition wrote a very Pepsi statement. 
At the time of the Jamaat assault, the Trinidad and Tobago football team was playing Grenada at the National Stadium. It was to be a blessing in disguise, according to then head of the army, Ralph Brown. Within minutes, the fact was known that, that it was in fact the Jamaat that had blown up the police headquarters. And I tried to remain as calm as possible, I mean, without trying to disrupt the football match. And uh, we asked the soldiers and sailors who were gathered in the stadium to report to the front of the stadium. At TTT, Baca was proceeding with his plans, outlining new reasons for the group's decision to storm the Red House and TTT. The new interim government, therefore, immediately abolishes all that. You know, I started to say, but come on, what are we into here? We're into showmanship. Um, and people out there are not going to accept this. Baca was also confident that he would receive the support of the army and the public. He felt that the population would respond to his call for no looting. He was wrong. In fact, many feel his statements only incited the armed forces. Indeed, Brown says just a couple hours after it started, the insurrection was effectively over. The Jamaat have since disputed this claim, adding that the armed forces were tardy and ineffective in mobilizing. In fact, a third truck bearing arms had left the Trin City compound that afternoon and brought more arms to the Red House area. Also, other members of the group were joining the assault through Friday evening. Remember, the original number was 60 and at the end it was 114. But the fact is that the army did eventually take up positions around the Red House, cutting it off, and then the bombardment began. Ralph Brown says the army was shooting at a level which would be safe for the hostages. But there were no guarantees. For those inside, it was a nightmare. They lined us up like this, you know. Um, and there was a, a gunman at the head of each person, right? Like that, you know, right there. And Bilal, I heard Bilal telling them, the lights are on now, okay? So mark your purse, mark your victim, because we understand that they are going to storm the, the parliament and a sig the, the signal for the storming of the parliament would be the taking out of the, taking out of the lights. So mark you. I remember that so distinct. You know, in all the things, there are some things you remember more than others. And he says, mark your victim because the lights are going to be out. And as soon as the lights go out, um, shoot your victim. If the lights go out, shoot your victim. And, uh, but fortunately, the lights never went out. <laughs> it was the same at TTT, with that building also under constant bombardment. A raging battle ensued the following morning. We then took up on top there. I was stationed up there with two men. We had men there on top of this building. We had men on the ground here. We had men on that building there. Then we had men at this corner here so that we had this whole street covered. When the American forces came down, the white boys with barrettes, purple barrettes, they were trying to come down Marley Street. Our forces both at the top, our snipers were pinning them down. We were firing at them randomly. They were like covering like from here and they would just come out. We could just fire down, get back in here. Then this other group here, they will start firing down there. The bottom group here would again come out, fired down there. So we basically we had the white boys, the, the American forces pinned down for over five hours. They couldn't take the street. But the army says the Jamaat was mistaken and insists that at no time were foreign troops involved. The Jamaat had mined areas around TTT and had vowed that if the army was to storm, many people would die. Part of this half of this area here would have gone. Maybe part of this building would have gone. The, the other two would have taken off the other half of the streets. Surrounding thing would have taken off that. The Jamaat had sent a group to take out the remaining frequency at Radio 100. The group failed. They did not attempt to disable access from Camp Ogden although it had been suggested. And very importantly, 
they did not count on the fact that TTT could be taken off the air. They don't know the technology and they didn't know it could happen, but they had catered, they, they never catered for that. That is the foolishness about the thing. And I'm sorry, I'm not a tactician, but nobody ever secured the transmitter. And Bernard Pantin and a group of people, and army people, were able to go up there and secure the transmitter. We just basically unplugged um, the feed into channel 13 transmitter and plugged the camera in, in very ordinary light. Um, and that signal was seen by people who saw channel 13. Contrary to earlier broadcasts, the government of Trinidad and Tobago has not fallen. I wish to assure each and every one of you that the situation is under control. Contrary to, popular, to what has been relayed earlier this evening, I want to assure the population that the, that the regiment and indeed the de entire defense force has not collaborated with, nor do we intend to collaborate with, those perpetrators of this crime. During this period, a man who was to play a critical role over the next few days had been taken out of his home in San Fernando and brought to Camp Ogden. I uh, was put off just at the corner of Edward Street and I walked from Edward Street to the Red House and there was a, I was escorted upstairs. Some people told me shots were fired over my head but I didn't know. It is here that a disturbing element begins to emerge. There appears to have been serious conflict between the army and the police. Ralph Brown hints at it but shrugs it off. Command headquarters had been bombed, policemen had been shot, one had been shot dead, the, the sentry, others have been seriously injured, and, and some of the top echelon, I mean an, an ACP I think, was, was seriously injured, and news had been filtered, and news of that event had gotten around very, very quickly. And, and so they must have been demoralized. But it was much more serious, it seems, than he suggests. A oh, fire cussing, cussing me and Mr. Robinson, cussing the... Uh, Who was cussing you and Mr. Uh, well, I expect the, the, some of the armed forces, not the soldiers, but I think some of the police seemed to... didn't like what was taking place. I mean, one could understand, in hindsight, uh, Canon Clark, what are you doing there? Blankety blank, and uh, so to Mr. Robinson. In an interesting development, Lincoln Meyer says a proposal was actually seriously considered for an interim government of which Abu Bakr would be part. But I will tell you that the Imam was to have been the Minister of National Security. And then came an interesting development inside Parliament, which was to change the course of events. One of the men targeted by the Muslimin, ironically, became the one who would ensure that they would eventually walk free. Well, that was when, when, when Selwyn got involved. Now, Selwyn did not get involved early because, remember, he was shot. But then perhaps he felt better. Um, he was in his leg. Yeah. And then he obviously felt better. So I think it was sometime sat during the Saturday that he, I remember him asking for documents and um, between, I think he, he was the main person and then he was talking with Bilal and whatnot and so on. It was here too that opposition MP John Humphrey was to play a key role. Mr. Humphrey, he told them, I remember that very well, he said, um, how, how are you going to know that? They, they have to put it down. How are, you going to, how are you going to know that you're going to get this amnesty? It has to be written down. The proposal was taken back to those in charge who had moved to the Hilton by now. But even this was met with resistance by some of the government members. In the end, it was delivered to those at Red House. The authorities insist that the amnesty was never valid a claim subsequently upheld by the Privy Council, but one that was overturned in our own courts. The fact is, however, that the Jamaat had its document and promptly set about making copies. Um, King Bilal Abdullah had one copy, King John Humphrey took one, 
um, you should think of one. Somebody else might have to take one. And I kept one for myself, right? Um, when I was walking around with, my, with mine, Kevin Ramnath, you know, just stretched out his hand and took it away from me like if, you know, somebody just taking something from a baby kind of way. I didn't resist him. I said, let's leave him with it. And um, when we left the, the Red House and the first, right, everybody, all the copies were taken from everybody who left the Red House. And that copy was the copy that surfaced eventually to, you know, to be the um, copy that <laughs> made history. The leadership had made its decision. They would walk out and lay down arms. For the youth in the Jamaat, it was a bitter pill to swallow. We had our feelings. We had our feelings, but we are people who, in whatever situation we find ourselves in, we, we, we depend, not depend in the sense of dependence, but we we, we we are guided by leadership. It was over, but not before the country had been seriously scarred. Most disturbingly, the ease at which anarchy reared its head. Some $300 million in damage had been done. It's one moment in my life that I have, when I saw the destruction of Port of Spain, what people are capable of doing, you know, and not just the looting. If, you, if you're hungry and you, you want to loot and you've taken the stuff, but to, to, to burn the place down after that, and to, the, 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 ty the type of damage that I saw in Port of Spain after that is, is, is unpardonable. This country, I've never seen a country where every other group feels itself more deprived than the other group. And relative deprivation has been proven to be the seed of crowd reaction in such instances, looting and civil strife. The bloodshed had come to an end, but not before 24 people had been killed and 119 injured. Leo Devine's probably the most high-profile casualty. The names of a few are etched in stone at what is supposed to be a caution to all of the lawlessness of 1990, the eternal flame. To this day, the scars of the families of those killed have not healed. The family of Lorraine Caballero is one such. She was a clerk who had been gunned down at Red House. It wasn't easy. It was not easy, man. To know anyone have... To know something happened for a cause which nobody knows the cause up to now. I don't know who knows the cause, but I don't know the cause why she died, you know. But she died for an un unjust cause. Over the two years following the 1990 attempted coup, the country was to go through possibly its most famous trial. At the end of the day, Justice Klebert Brooks ruled in favor of the Jamaat. They were freed. The state appealed, however, and it went to the Privy Council. The result of that is now history, with the Privy Council ruling that while the amnesty was not valid, since the prisoners were not immediately released, the Jamaat could not be retried. In their efforts to escape the events of 1990, the population also turned its fury on a number of those at the heart of the insurrection. People like Jones Madeira and Dean Nolly Clark, who feel their only crime was getting out alive. I don't want to say it, but my church also gave me hell. And then of course says the question whether it will ever happen again. Some including Jamaat members say no, not in the way of 1990 but they cannot say no in terms of societal discontent. The intelligence aspects of the security forces have improved, according to Ralph Brown, himself a former head of the Security Intelligence Agency. I, 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 can, I can assure the national community that, in fact, things were put in place that, 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 would, alert, that would have alerted us to something like this happening again. But several of the other issues have not been as readily addressed. The situation in the courts, which continues even today. The lack of public discussion on the Mukarapo land issue. Jamaat claims of connections within the security services and the involvement, if any, of those offering themselves for high office. There is a feeling that those questions need answering and that the time has come for the appointment of a commission of inquiry. I know 10 years have passed. Maybe people might find it not important anymore. But even if you don't have an inquiry, what you should have is some kind of investigation. 
so as to highlight the weaknesses in the system and take corrective measures. And so we end with yet another question. Will the Commission of Inquiry ever be appointed? Will some of those hidden truths ever be finally, officially uncovered? Or will those six days in 1990 forever remain a dark, unresolved period in the history of Trinidad and Tobago? Not in this house, not in this garden of Eden. Oh, how we dance to the beat of this lovely light, lovely light. Until a man opened the door and showed us our other side And all our mecha delusions walked right on by Now truly we know what is Uzi diplomacy Now truly we know what is SLR love In all these troubled times under the stars above I say under the stars above